Mike is um, a great teacher, a great motivator. He 100% invests his heart and his soul into the athletes he believes in. He has no problem giving his time, his energy, his resources to anybody that wants to be the absolute best that they can be. Probably one of the most giving people. He's got a heart of gold. He's just the most honest guy I, I've ever run into. Amazing. If you work hard for him, he will be your greatest cheerleader. He wants you to excel, wants to push you. He wants you to do a little bit more than you thought you could do. And that's a great attribute. And uh, so that's, that's Mike. I mean, really and truly. And, and then just a great friend. Great, great friend. So. Atop a hill in the arid landscape of Bonzo, California, just east of Camp Pendleton and the gentle wash of the San Diego coastline, sits a small family-run gym. No ordinary training space, this gym has become a home for athletes of all shapes, sizes, strengths and weaknesses. With its colourful history emblazoned upon every wall, this calm and focused training ground has become a mecca for athletes training in Olympic weightlifting. But it's not the space itself that draws the crowds. It's the man who runs the show. The head of the family and the coach whose name sits above the door. This is Mike's gym, where legends come to be born, where geezers become young, and the spirit of Father Lang lives on. But we were there for one specific reason, to see the godfather of weightlifting, Coach Mike Bergner. With 60 years of experience under his belt as a professional weightlifting coach, Mike is well schooled in the art of these meets. Warming up his athletes, calling attempts, his guidance has taken lifters all the way to the highest echelons of the sport, the Olympic stage. But no two weightlifters are the same. Each athlete differs physically, psychologically and technically. So what are the common elements in his approach to coaching? We're here to find out. Coach, what was the highlight for you today? I know it's not been, this is not like the, one of the third or fourth meet you've been to, you've been to a lot. Like what was the best part of the day? I just love to see the lifters perform. Or it's just a matter of that I'm so addicted to the sport that when I come into a gym like this, which is predominantly Olympic style weightlifting gym, and you walk and you see this, the, the platform and you see the audience and you see the setup, uh, and then you come back into the warm-up room and you see kilo plates instead of pound plates. Uh, <laughs> and you see all the, you know, all the coaches and the, the nervousness of the athlete and uh, you know the nervousness of the coach it's just it's just one of those things that you just uh, spent all my life doing so 
That's what it is. Do you take the uh, the same basic strategy when you're preparing an athlete in that last final moments before a competition, the day of? Is it the same basic principles that you carry into a competition with you? Yeah, I train my athletes uh, very specifically for their strengths and their weaknesses. And, you know, even if the athlete is six months from a major competition, we warm them up every time that we do a workout with a snatch or the clean and jerk, their warm-ups are exactly the same. Now, as they get better, the warm-ups may change, but nevertheless, we'll do a, maybe two sets with the bar just to loosen up. Yeah. You know, we'll get them to stand up, walk around, maybe do some jump roping to get the blood flowing and whatever. But the weights and, and the poundages that they take are exactly the same for every workout that they're going to be doing in the meet. So there's no surprises. Mm-hmm. You know, they know they're going to do a set of three with something, a set of two for something, and then after that, it's singles all the way through. Yeah, and that approach you were, we were talking earlier, that, that goes back deep into your history to your days at Notre Dame and your right. time at the Marine Corps. You are talking about how uh, during football practices at Notre Dame, there was the expectation that things would be the same each time. And that sort of gave you the basis to, what, to, to refine and build this foundation each time you sort of suited up. So weightlifting is no different, right? Yeah, absolutely. I always tell the story at my courses that I run that – that the fundamentals of teaching, the fundamentals of coaching, the fundamentals for an athlete stay the same, stance, grip, and position. And I reiterate to the audience that one of my favorite stories was a story about Vince Lombardi. He's an a athletic coaching figure god <laughs> at the oh time. My, oh, my God. He was my my type of guy. I wish I had the, the, uh, uh, the ability to have been coached by him because he, he was amazing. But nevertheless... He would walk in every year in front of the Green Bay Packers, the all-pro Green Bay Packers, Mm -hmm. and he would carry a football. He'd carry it in his arm, and he'd have one end tucked in here in his his shoulder and the other end hand over the ball. And he would get in front of these guys, the Bard Stars, the – you know, the John – the Hornings, the Paul Hornings, all these guys. And he'd say, gentlemen, this is a football. (laughs) Now, that's how fundamental he became, and that's exactly – the way he ran it. He ran that Green Bay sweep the same a thousand times. The people knew that was coming a thousand times. They knew it was coming and they knew what snap count it was on and they still couldn't, they still couldn't stop it. So for me, the fundamentals of teaching, the drills and skills that we have, it doesn't matter whether you're an Olympian, doesn't matter if you're a youngster coming in, we do the drills and skills to make us comfortable where we're uncomfortable. Because 90% of all this stuff is in between the years. Yeah. You know, they come to a meet and they haven't done the same thing and all of a sudden you change it on them. They become nervous. They become a basket case. Mm-hmm. And now you as a coach, your strategy has to change. One athlete might be one case, and one, like very calm, maybe too calm. One athlete may be you know, too many scoops of whatever they took before the meet right. and now they're boiling over. Right. And said so it was your responsibility to understand what their, what their state was and to be the countering, like the yin to their yang, basically. Yeah, yeah. I thought yeah. it was a very elegant way of saying it. It's not one mindset. You know your athletes are different, but you have to be able to adapt and be very plastic and adaptable. Yeah, yeah. I'm, here's the thing that I've always said. I'm, I'm there for the athlete. The athlete's not there for me. So it's not about the coach. It's about the coach making that athlete – become the best that they can become and if whatever it takes it's about your relationship with that athlete and whatever that athlete needs you need to become so when the athlete does miss an attempt and and they they come backstage and and you go over to them do you do you more often say why do you think you missed or do you go out back and say hey you know when you dipped you made this mistake or like do you tell them what they did wrong or do you ask them to see if they know what they did wrong no i don't i don't usually ask them anything i just tell them you know it's okay mm-hmm. you know let's finish better if i'm training them in the gym mm-hmm. then i can i'll very often say well why what do you think you missed that loop mm-hmm. or if somebody sends me a video and they'll say coach can you critique this lift for me and i will critique the lift and then what will happen is i'll take screenshots of the lift and I'll send them back to them Mm -hmm. and I'll put them in sequence, right? The sequence order. And I'll say to them, tell me what you see. And these are usually people that have taken my course. They know what, you know, the, what I'm after. And 90% of the time they don't see it when it's full, Mm -hmm. but they will see it when I put it in frame by frame for them. And I Mm -hmm. make them tell me, why did you miss this? 
Oh my God, look at how soft my back is. Oh geez, the weight is shift. The barbell is pulling me forward. Mm-hmm. You know, there's certain things that happen that if you let the bar pull you forward, then you're 90 percent of the time you're not going to finish the weight. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or you're going to have to <clears throat> counterbalance that weight. And now I'm going to really have to focus on finishing. And now the bar is swinging away from my body. You know? mm-hmm. the physics. Yeah. You can and never get away a, from it. That's it. <laughs> Force times distance over time. It's not changing. Yeah. The bar is in the least line of resistance or it's not. Yeah. You know? so. Do you it, spend a lot of time coaching in that in that manner to your athletes, teaching them the physics of it and like, you know, drawing force time diagrams and things like that? Because I learned weightlifting from a mechanical engineer. Right. And so yeah. it, was, it was all physics. That's right. flavored me- your Mechanics is physics, basically. So so I grew up with that with that heavy emphasis, but I, I noticed a lot of other people don't. Do, do you emphasize that at all? Well, there's a few things that I say. You know, for an example, you know, where do you get your power from? You know, where, where is force times distance over time? I mean, ultimately, you're going to get it from your legs, but where mm-hmm. where does the leg start? Where does it start from? you got to push on the ground. you got to push on the ground. So, yeah. I mean, it, the feet, 90% of all missed lifts are through the feet. Mm-hmm. You know, if you don't drive through the feet, if you don't drive through the legs, you're not going to create acceleration. So if you're a, a mamby-pamby against the ground, <laughs> right, then mm-hmm. that's that's a coaching tool. you got to drive hard through the ground. you got to create acceleration on the barbell. Mm-hmm. You pull the bar with your arms, the acceleration diminishes. So you have to learn to drive hard with the legs through the ground, mm. through your feet. Opposite reactions for your actions. There you go. <laughs> I right. mean, every, oppo- every action has an opposing yeah. reaction, right? So, and, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, you've got to understand that a lot of people just pull too long. Mm. You know, if you pull too long, guess what's going to happen? The bar is going to decelerate, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that, that position of learning how to if you will, and people are not going to particularly like this word, but a 15-year-old taught me this. So, Coach, why don't you just say jump? It seems like a lot easier, doesn't it? And I'm going, God, that was a 15-year-old, and that was about 30 years ago. I'm going, (laughs) yeah, let's do it. Let's do do the jump. And then -hmm. then you have to go back and you got to say, okay, well, I'm not talking about jumping and touching a rim and basketball stuff, and I'm about talking about driving like through your feet. Incentive to mm-hmm. exactly. go, yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, right. I have a, and this same 15-year-old taught me with a jump rope. Your opportunity. Yeah, you want to see that? I mean, if you, I don't sure. know if you want yeah, to or sure not. Yeah. So this athlete was telling me, she says, look, coach, this is, you're talking about your arms are like ropes. Here it is. And you're talking about acceleration of the barbells. This is what you're talking about. And she's, she went on to explain that my hand when I'm holding this is, is the feet against the ground. She said, so when you jump, you actually go down, right? So you go down and up. The weight flies. And the weight fly becomes weightless. And, and you, the minute that that weight goes up, you are now going down your feet are mm-hmm. moving out and you are going down and i'm going that's amazing yes i'm so you know 25 <laughs> or 30 years ago this 15 year old taught me that and we use it all the time because that is the maximum acceleration against the ground and now the timing of it is becomes important because there's three pulls in weightlifting right mm-hmm. so now the third pull when your feet are moving out and you're pulling on the bar. How can I pull a barbell up if I'm going under the bar? If my exactly. feet are moving. Mm-hmm. If my feet are moving out, they're only sliding out and they're only coming off the ground that much. But that's the acceleration that now I'm pulling on the bar. And what does that do to me? Throws me underneath that bar. Mm-hmm. If I drop mm-hmm. underneath the bar, it's too slow. Right. If I try to catch the bar, which is a common term, in my opinion... That's t- you're going to be waiting on I'm, it. I'm going to be waiting like on Like you're waiting it. on a pitch to be thrown at you. Yeah, it's it's it, a passive action. The idea is that you go to the bar, you pull yourself to that bar. Wherever the bar is, if it's here, you, you get it there, and then you go down. If the bar's here, you learn to move, you move the feet. I mean, I can take a heavy weight. Now, that's a light weight, and I can get it as high as I want. But guess what? I can take and put 25 kilos on there and do the same thing, and that bar won't move as far, but the acceleration pattern, I have to learn to time that and move my feet out so I can pull myself underneath that bar. And I pull myself down and around that barbell, and then I have to solidify it overhead or on my chest. I think one of the greatest markers of your success seems to be that you are triggering your, the athletes around you to think about the why and to think about what it is they need to understand that's sort of setting off a spark in their mind right i think you know and again that comes to the athlete that depends on the athlete and you have an athlete that overthinks it (laughs) now you got to get them to underthink it it's not on them Mm -hmm. i'm telling you right now it's not on them it's on me so the, the athletes i had today it wasn't it wasn't about 
you know, my performance for that athlete. It's about me getting that athlete to be the best that they can possibly be. And I want that athlete to feel trust. I mm-hmm. want that athlete to trust me uh, and be able to say, you know what, I'm in the best hands. I'm just going to relax and I'm going to do exactly what the hell he tells me to do. it, Because they can get in their head and they can start negative talking. And the oh, negative yeah. talking is what, <laughs> is what really mm-hmm. screws them up. If, some, if a coach is just starting in, in the weightlifting world and they're trying to get athletes to trust them from a leadership perspective, like how can you have that, that type of presence and that, that type of authority where, where an athlete does trust you enough to just kind of follow you with that blind faith? What do you, what do, you do? How well, does that, that happen? It depends on who you are. I mean, a great coach, a great coach will say very little. Mm. Yeah, I got my master's from the University of Kentucky when Adolf Rupp. I don't know if you guys Rupp ever, Arena. Mm-hmm. Rupp Arena. Named after the man. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Adolf Rupp was one of the greatest basketball coaches uh, of all time. Mm-hmm. And when I was first starting coaching, um, you know, I was coaching football, I would go into the arena and I'd watch Adolf Rupp run a two-hour basketball practice and not say one word. Wow. Mm. Now that is a statement. <laughs> Most coaches would feel the need to bark constantly. Every time they saw anything wrong, they'd be on it. You, you, know? can, mm-hmm. you, can, you can go to a, a national championship, and I, and I know, you know, I've seen this happen a thousand times. Okay, let's go. Pull, pull, pull. Get up. Stay tight. Stay tight. Okay, breathe, 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 breathe. You know, the coach is over there <laughs> telling the athlete what to do. Mm-hmm. The athlete doesn't hear shit. <laughs> you know, the athlete is, you know, you give one cue. Air. Period. You know, if the athlete's nervous, then, you know, you want to sit back and not say anything to the athlete. Hey, you know what? Let's have some fun. Let's just enjoy this. I think mm-hmm. that's a key one. Giving people, like giving yourself and giving the athlete permission to say, that this is fun, right? Yeah. You want to do this. Right. You want to be here. Mm-hmm. You would rather be here than anywhere else. All right. right. Mm-hmm. Well, let's just go do this thing. Right. So being a good coach really is about almost being more than just a coach. Is that kind oh, of what you're getting at? Absolutely. If you're just coaching, then you're one-minded, and that's it. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to know my athletes. I want to know, you know, maybe my athlete got in a fight with her girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Maybe my athlete's parents are all over them about lifting weights, and they don't want them to lift weights. You know, so you've Mm -hmm. got to get into the head of the athlete and know what that athlete's all about. Mm -hmm. And to be sterile, and I only care about weightlifting, is not really, in my opinion, the way to go to go about coaching athletes. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's nothing you can do that is going to change the demeanor of the athlete unless you work with them. You know, the idea is being able to work with them, spending time. And I'm going to work with you. I want to know you. I mean, I know you like lifting weights, but I want to know what... <laughs> that much is obvious, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's it. You, and you want, to, you want to know the athlete. You know, one of my athletes, I walked down the aisle. Oh, that's amazing. You know, I mean, and it was like the, that trust, that bond was there and, she, and she's like a daughter to me you know she became a national champion so Can i we mean talk about amy everett amy everett is mm-hmm. is is the, is the young lady amy everett holds a very special place within the bergner family she first came to mike's gym on a recommendation from her volleyball coach a troubled teenager from a difficult background but with athletic potential as yet untapped she headed up that hill to meet the man who would change her life and shape her future in so many ways. I think that I was going to go there and train for a couple days just to get some cues and stuff for to transfer over to volleyball. And I ended up falling in love and I ended up quitting volleyball and staying with weightlifting. I felt, honestly, I felt like I was home. I was so lost and I had just left my own home and which was a very bad situation and I was kind of just trying to find my own and you know I was supposed to go off to college to Long Beach State and I was scared to do that and I just didn't know where I really belonged and um, I just felt so at home and I just trained full-time I never he pretty much never got never got rid of me I I kid with him now and say I was like a barnacle and I just like attached and never left We call him my surrogate father. He has very much taken on the fatherly role for me the past 20 years and has adopted me into his family and into his home. And he's been there through all of my ups and downs. Coaching is a full-time job and it goes beyond just what's in the rate room. And he taught me from a very young age that I could call him at any time and complain about 
boy problems or I was having a hard time in school or my problems being a single mom or you know whatever the issue was I could go to him and he would help me so that when I go into the gym to train I could focus on my task on hand. Oh, beautiful. You can't teach a coach to coach that way. You can teach a coach, you know, how to coach a sport or how to, you know, coach Olympic weightlifting. You can teach a coach how to teach somebody else to lift, but you can't teach a coach how to coach with their soul. And that's something that he does so naturally, and I'm so proud to pass on that legacy of his to my own athletes. So what would you like to say directly to Coach Dean about what he's meant to you? Oh geez, now, see now is when you make me cry. Um, and I think this message goes to Leslie too because when he adopted me, you know, of course she gets stuck with me as well, but I think that he has shown me how to love and he has shown me how to be the very best version of myself. He found me my husband, and he has shown me how to come full circle from an athlete to a coach at World Championships. To that I say, thank you so much, Pops, and I love you from the bottom of my heart and to all that I have. Thank you for giving me this beautiful life and for believing in me when I didn't even believe in myself and for giving me the strength when I had none. I love you. Come on home. Hold me and I will hold you in my arms. And you're so big. Sorry. <laughs> no, I told you exactly. I would cry. This man means the world to me. I'm like, how can you ever find words to express what you feel or to pay back someone who has given you so much? And not in like materialistic things, but just in hugs and warmth and tears and laughs and a beautiful life. Like there's no, there's no words that make that amazing. It just is, right? <laughs> it just is. It just is. The end. On a weekly basis, a group of friends meet to take a walk, share their troubles and sweat it out in the gym. All in their later years with ages ranging from 50 to 81, these men are the geezers, Coach B's training buddies. With a strong sense of camaraderie and a healthy dose of comedy within the gang, they're a fun group to be around. Look at, look at that. Hey. <laughs> oh, she did it! <laughs> But what's special about these guys is their determination and tenacity. They come here not just to support each other through a workout, but to cheer each other on in life and its highs and lows. Unflinching in the face of old age, they prove that it's not how many rotations you have seen under the sun, but how you've danced in its light. Seven-year-old guy doing 45-pound dumbbell. Hey, uh, everybody, come on up, and I'll explain what we're doing. And you're going to select any exercise you want. I'll set it up, and we'll do Tabata sit-ups, and we'll do that for three rounds total. From various backgrounds and different walks of life, they leave the troubles of the world behind and do what gym buddies do the world over. They hustle hard and leave nothing left in the tank. Okay, second round, 
I'm coming up. The guys in this community are just all really, really, really good. They all bring their sense of humor. There's no attitudes here. You get the hot tub syndrome. It's all encouragement. Well, there's no looking down on somebody because they can't do something. There's encouragement to, to be able to do more. The camaraderie here, the stories. I'm just impressed with a lot of these, these guys. I look at it as one of the most life-changing things I've ever done in my life. Mike Bergner is convalescent home. <laughs> so having been in strength conditioning for you know decades before CrossFit really became a big thing, there's there's probably many things that that you did before CrossFit was popular that most people these days would kind of identify as being CrossFit. Like how how has CrossFit really changed how how you do your conditioning or how you do all the things that aren't just pure weightlifting? Well, CrossFit taught me that there's a lot of ways to skin a cat, right? I mean, I'm the purist. I'm the only guy that. I only believe in weightlifting. I don't believe in much of anything else. I mean, I'm going to use weightlifting for football. I'm going to use weightlifting for basketball. I'm going to use weightlifting for soccer. Mm. So I'm smart enough to know that the cardio portion's in there, and it needs to be. You know, I might do circuit training in the fact that we would do snatches, and then I might have them go do box jumps. Mm. Or we'd do snatches or clean and jerks, and I'd have them run down the hill and back up again. Mm. For their conditioning for football. Right. <clears throat> I would never do that with a weightlifter. The weightlifter is a guy that's going to be lifting weights, and if he has to walk to the dinner table, he's pissed off. <laughs> that was that's basically the mindset that we had, that I had. Mm. And when CrossFit came around, and uh, you know, the way Coach Glassman explained it to me, that he really wants to work that fitness aspect, mm -hmm. and he wants to prepare that body for the unknown and unknowable. You know, basically, we want to make you comfortable where you're uncomfortable. Mm. All of those aspects of, of conditioning, which I believed in, but I just didn't know how to put in words so mm. eloquently. Mm. You know, I became, a, I'm going, well, whoa, that, that really makes sense. But it doesn't make sense for weightlifting. It makes sense for all the other stuff I was doing, but mm. it didn't make sense for weightlifting. And then Grace and Isabel came along, and I'm really... You know, I'm a senior international weightlifting coach. Uh, I've been a uh, the junior world team coach. I've been a senior world team coach. And so, how can anybody do 30 snatches and 30 clean and jerks for time? I mean, you got to be kidding me. That's nuts. And I, the technique was just deplorable, right? Sure. And so, I made it my mission to try to clean up the technique. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, that was my mission. And uh, when Coach asked me to come along and, and do the seminars with him, mm -hmm. uh, the first seminar I did was in Golden, Colorado. And, you know, no one could do an overhead squat with PVC pipe. Mm -hmm. And these, this is with first responders, Navy SEALs, Marine Force Recon, Army Green Berets, you know, police officers, firefighters. Yeah. We had 50 people in the class, and there wasn't one person that could do an overhead squat with PVC pipe. Mm -hmm. So my mission became that... I'm going to accept Grace and Isabel because it's going to have people snatching and clean and jerking. Mm -hmm. And if we got people snatching and clean and jerking, then we're going to have athletes that are going to compete. Mm -hmm. And of course, USA Weightlifting thought I was crazy. You know, no one's going to do this. Mm -hmm. And now, after you know, five or six years, they've realized that more and more people. When I was involved, heavily involved with weightlifting, we had 2,500 to 3,000 members. And now there's close to 15,000, as I understand it. Mm -hmm. So that that's because they're crossfitters crossfitters want information they want knowledge they're not afraid to pay for it they want to become better they want to become better crossfitters mm -hmm. but the residual takes place in that not everybody's going to go to the games not everybody's going to the regionals but you know what everybody can compete mm -hmm. in a weightlifting contest and have fun doing it and the beautiful thing about it is the crossfit community are cheerers they love camaraderie. Mm -hmm. They love togetherness. And you'll go to a weightlifting contest, and uh, yesterday's weightlifting contest, they played music all the way through. Right. I mean, it was, it was, it was, that's because of CrossFit. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's fired up. Guys, the lifters are having fun. You go to a regular weightlifting contest years ago, somebody starts lifting, and then it's, everything's quiet. It's flat. But the CrossFitters, the first lifter that comes out, on the platform is the lifter that's going to lift the lightest weight, right? 
But the CrossFit community is cheering that lifter like nobody else's. Mm -hmm. Like giving that lifter a, that go, 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 and then cheering that makes the lift. And it may be 30 kilos that they don't care. It's That lifter's up there in front of a group, putting her health, himself out in front of everybody. And guess what? They're going to be cheered for it. Mm -hmm. And that's what CrossFit has brought to the weightlifting community. What do you think uh, kept a lot of the coaches from being as open-minded as you were? I mean, uh, that's how I see it. It's like you were open-minded and some coaches right. weren't so open-minded. What do you think is uh, kind of set you apart? What made you like more open to it versus some other coaches? Well, I, I love the sport of weightlifting. Weightlifting is my sport, right? Yeah. And the goal that I had when Glassman first you know, started with this, I've always looked at ways that we could make weightlifting bigger and better, yeah. right? So I'm a school teacher. What's the, what's the most obvious way that I can help make our community better? Is I can teach weightlifting in my classes. Well, my open-mindedness came because I saw these guys like yourself doing the snatch and clean and jerk and their technique was ugly. Mm -hmm. So my goal wasn't to recruit you. My goal was to train you how to teach, how to coach, so that you could train your clients, right? Mm -hmm. And then those clients are gonna have children. You're seeing the bigger picture. I'm seeing the big picture. Right. I'm seeing the big ass picture. Yeah. I'm seeing that the clients are going to have children. I'm looking at it like my point. I ran a gym here, a weightlifting facility, and you'd look around and Sage would be out here playing with the dog and then run inside the gym and get a PVC pipe and snatch it and throw it down on the ground and yell, yeah, and then run out and play with the dog again. <laughs> so what did she see? She wanted to be like the big people. Yeah. She wanted, she, so it was leading by example is all it was. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's, that's who I was going after. I wasn't right. going after you as a coach, you're too old. I wasn't even going after your clients because they're too old. But I'm going after the client's children because wow. the children are going to come to the gym and they're going to see mm -hmm. you doing the snatch and guess what? They're going to want to do it. Yeah. Well, I I short I cut myself short. I hell I should have gone after the clients right away because the clients were 18, 19 and 20. So, what did I do? I revolutionized. We're going to teach technique. Yeah. And and I I said, "Let's let's do Grace and Isabel, but let's do it according to standards." Right? Well, I lost that battle. But that was all right. I used Natalie Wolfolk Bergner, my daughter-in-law, as an example. The first time she ever did Isabella, it took her seven minutes and 50 seconds. And she's laying on the ground in a fetal position. Yeah. Right? She's a weightlifter, right? <laughs> well, about two weeks later, I said, nah, just don't. You know, she had the perfect way of setting up the same every single time. Right. Which is what weightlifters do, right? Mm -hmm. I said, you got great technique. Don't set up. It's with 95 pounds. You snatched 231. It's 95 pounds. Just keep it going. So she did touches and goes, and 10 reps later, she drops it and, you know, goes to the bar again, does another 10, goes to the bar again. She does it in like one minute and 50 seconds or something Damn. like that. Mm -hmm. With great technique. Right. Mm -hmm. So it can be done. Yeah. What you have to do and what I had to do is explain that. I want to do Isabel. I want to do Grace. It's great cardio. You're doing it with 95 pounds, for God's sake, or 135. What's the big deal? If you got great technique, if you got bad technique, I'm not going to call. I'm not going to count it. Mm -hmm. So get your technique better, and I'll count it. Well, what they learn, they learn technique becomes the driving force right. for what safety number one, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then it becomes the driving force for efficiency. Mm -hmm. And and for me, I call it effectiveness too. Mm -hmm. We want to teach in a safe, efficient, effective manner, mm -hmm. and it all boils out. That's why I'm so adamant about the burden of warm up done on a daily basis. It's that routine of the Vince Lombardi's and the Aeroparsegians and the Lou Holtz that the first 15 minutes of class, like we talked about yesterday, mm -hmm. or of practice has done exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Well, the Bergner warm up and the skill transfer exercises and three position snatches and the junkyard dog are done on a daily basis and they're done for a purpose and they're done for a reason. If I do that every single day and I yell out why I'm doing the exercise, that goes into my head, and now I know that, geez, I'm not getting speed through the middle, so maybe I ought to go over here and do down and finishes with a barbell to really focus on my speed through the middle. Mm -hmm. So it gives me 10 tools in the toolbox, right, so to speak, to work on my weaknesses. And then we all know that the force comes through the ground, and one of the best exercises to ex enhance explosive power is jumping.
-hmm. So the junkyard dog is a jumping exercise that's done every single day. Mm. So, it, you know, our goal is to get more powerful in that way. So it's, it's been a journey, but it's, it's uh, the weightlifting coach that I was, I don't think, still some of them don't see the big picture. Even though there's 400 people lifting at a national championship when you used to only have 125 and be happy with it. Yeah. You know, so. What's clear about Mike is his passion for weightlifting runs truly deep. It makes sense that his home became the gym and in turn for others, the gym became their home. All are welcome here, whether you're a blood relation or an aspiring athlete or one of the geezers. Once you walk through that door, you're considered a member of the clan, just one of the family. There are no boundaries to the connectedness you feel in the Bergner home. Past, present and future all exist in this sanctuary. No matter whether it's thoughts on training or a home-cooked meal you're sharing with Coach B, it's all served up with a sizable portion of love. Father Lang was a graduate of Notre Dame. He was he, he went to Notre Dame as a minimum. He graduated in 1912, and uh, he was, decided to become a priest, and he was ordained. And in 1926, he was the rector of sophomore dorm, which is uh, where all the sophomores lived. And in 1926, my father was a student in sophomore dorm, so he would tell me stories about Father Lang that were just incredible. But. That was a long time ago. So, fast forward, we met in uh, Father Lang's gym. You and myself and Coach Bergner. Uh, mm -hmm. Father Lang owned all the weights. The racks were built by him, and he ran a tight ship. At 4.30, everybody left. You had to leave. If you didn't leave, he had a stack of two and a half pound and five pound plates next to his desk. He would throw at you. <laughs> Frisbee throw at you. Yeah, yeah. right. But he was always incentivizing us to do things. He, 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 he'd somehow know that you needed money for something. And then he would challenge you and for $20 or $50 or whatever he thought you needed. And if you succeeded, which you did, he gave you the money. And what, what were some of those challenges that he would propose to you guys? There would be things like if you could hang from the... Chin up, pull up bar for five minutes or ten minutes. I think it was ten minutes. You got twenty dollars. That's that's hard. It's hard. That's really hard. Very hard. I didn't do it. Mm. <laughs> I tried it. It lasted about a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a photo of him when he was sixty years old, and he deadlifted six hundred pounds. Wow. Mm. At sixty. This is a photograph of him when we were there. At eighty. He's eighty years old in 80, that picture. Eighty years old. He looks fantastic. I know. Yeah. One, one time a day, he would get up from his desk and he would walk down to the bench press, mm -hmm. the low platform bench press. He would sit down on it. We would help him lay back on his back. One, he would stick his arms up like this. One person would give him an 85 pound dumbbell in his right hand and a 65 in his left hand. And he would do 10 reps as fast as anybody could. Mm -hmm. Then we'd take him and he would, we'd help him back up and he would go back to his desk. So I did that one time, and I said, Father, why 65 in the left and 85? He says, well, you look at my, look at my bicep that ruptured it. Mm. Oh, that must have been painful. What happened? Well, I was doing 140s <laughs> one day, and, and the bicep ruptured. I said, oh, that had to hurt. He said, not as much as my nose when the dumbbell hit it. <laughs> <laughs> Coach, what do you appreciate most about Father Langley? Well, I think his leadership style was was what we needed. He was a tough taskmaster, and you know he would. Uh, you, there was a, there was never any doubt where Father Lang stood. You know, I mean, you you know he would say something, and you would absolutely jump too because that's just you, know, you didn't want to. You wanted to please him because he gave his heart and soul to us, and 
And did Basically, your mom to throw a plate at you? Yeah, I never got the plate thrown at me because never I, once. Not yeah, once. My ass was out of the gym when he yelled out. Yeah. It was it. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Some all Americans, which I wasn't, they they mm. came real close. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they never came back. <laughs> <laughs> So as the night draws close and thoughts turn to the feast that Chris has been preparing for us, it's time to tuck in. To sit down as a family, imbibe a little, and share some worldly wisdoms. <laughs> one, of, one of the things that I took from Father Lang discussion, or from Father Lang, is the human spirit is the most powerful thing, thing on earth. And I try to re remind that to people about that. that you have your bad days, but get your mind working and you can rise above that. And this is part of what CrossFit is, what Father Lang was all about. Mike and I learned from that. Well, it's like we always say, what the mind perceives, the body achieves, right? Life's great if you don't give up. That's right. the exactly. mantra that I have. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, exactly. Well, tell me your story. I mean, Terry, uh, you know, Fast Eddie has Parkinson's disease, and yeah. he's doing a lot to <coughs> try to eradicate. I'm, I'm playing it, paying it forward. Yeah, you know? I, I don't come up the driveway until people are already here most mornings. And the reason me is, it's not fun watching me climb that driveway because I'm really in bad shape. But yeah. a, you do you walk up the driveway still? Right. Yeah, yeah. And right. you come up with a smile on your face, right? Well, and you inspire not. all of us. He truly has modeled modeled his life after Father Lang. Mm -hmm. What else was Father Lang into just besides, <coughs> you know, dipping himself in ice cold waters and training and wrangling young knuckleheads? What else did he teach? Artist. He's an artist. He's an artist. What kind of art did he do? Right over there. You should see this artwork. You, you missed out on where you're No, I didn't get a part of that conversation. Yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. This was a, like a Renaissance man. Oh, oh God. We just, he's he drinks, he just weights, and he's an artist. Yeah. Yeah. So, let me ask you, in the next like decade, how many people do you think are uh, going to get access to the internet? Here to be honest, keep oh. saying that, like the next five yeah. years, it's going to like quadruple. Yeah. It's like a yeah, stack. It's a yeah. 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 No. So it's like a, the next decade, like... Uh, probably beyond what anybody here can comprehend, like a staggering amount of people are gonna get decent enough jobs and technology will allow them to lift up enough they don't have to work so hard and they're gonna have time and resource to like get off the field and like have a decent job and have excess energy and they're gonna start being interested in learning about their bodies. I think one of the most fascinating things is that there's gonna be literally like hundreds of millions of people who are gonna start spilling in exponentially into this, this online community. They're gonna find CrossFit, they're going to find weight loading, they're going to discover you. And what I find really amazing, what I'm, I see happening, is that all these people are going to kind of be able to funnel back down and capture this a little chunk of this legacy, that this light that, that Father Lang passed to you, right. that you have fought through the 70s and 80s and 90s, to, through all the taboos and people who are like, well, I don't know if it's such a good idea. Leading all the way up to the CrossFit revolution, the CrossFit putting this out there, then the podcast coming on scene, and this fractalization, more and more people are learning about this. How does it make you feel knowing that in the next 20 years, that basic message that Father Lang gave to you is going to be spread to yeah. millions well, of people. It's going to change their lives. Well, it's very humbling. I mean, it's, that's the point. But it's, it's a mission, right? It, it wasn't a direct mission, you have to do this, but it was a mission by leadership. Right. And know, by example. By, by example. And, uh, and now all of a sudden, you know, of all of our peers, you know, that we have, there's 10 or 15 of us that are producing the mission and we're going to carry it on. And it's our legacy. It's my job to give it to you know, my children so that they can carry it on, to give it to the people that we train in CrossFit, that they can, hopefully, I could be a father laying and, you know, Fast Eddie can be a father laying that would lead by example so that people would want to carry on that mission to somebody else, that we can motivate them to carry it on like he motivated us. Yeah. I, I encourage you, young fellows, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. to stop periodically and reflect where you are and what you're part of. One of the things that I think about 
at 68 is <clears throat> I'm not running this show anymore. You are. Yeah. yeah. And you better do a damn good job because I mean, you're going to piss me off if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, Mike, shit. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what you guys are doing, isn't it? I mean, yeah. that's, yeah. that's yeah. what you're doing yeah. right now. Is you're, you're bringing this and you're paying it forward. I can't even wrap my head around what could happen in 10, 20 years' time when all these eager, young, energetic people with much more energy than us and with the minds to push this thing past where we're going to push it. Yeah. We could really change how humanity views well, themselves and how they view strength and how they, you know, Father Lang can live on. And these people can, they'll learn about the holy waters and how to use a barbell and uh, and be and when they go into their lives. They'll be far more better than if this not had happened. Yeah, you know, it yeah. thrills me more than anything. I agree with you 100. One thing about weightlifting is, as you go pursue it, you put enough weight on the bar that you can't get up over your head, but someday you will. Yeah. And you always have the opportunity to step a little higher, a little faster, whatever it is. And even if you don't, you've done pretty well. Hmm. And that's the human spirit and not giving up. And, and I think my message to young people is be creative um, and gather, you ready for this, resources. Hmm. The more, the more resources you have, the easier it is on you because you can use one here or use one there. So what, what, what you've done here is you've created a few resources around this table for yourself and, and learn how to use them to the best of your ability to help yourself and everybody else. And That's the key right there. You'll find, and everybody that, else. find that you'll never be left out in the cold. The big thing about up here I was, um, I was, you know, I let go a little bit earlier than I wanted to get out of my job, and uh, I was lost. I can honestly say I was lost. Mm -hmm. This holy grail up here, <laughs> that's the way I look at it, mm -hmm. it brought me not only from the physical aspect of making my body stronger, mm -hmm. but mentally, yeah. it strengthens him, it strengthens him, it strengthens me, it strengthens Mike, it strengthens all of us, because... It's that bond that you have to have. Yeah. But the, the group here is just amazing. And I hope that, that when, when people think of us as the geezers, that they can see that there's not a limit to an age that you, could, that you would still be working at. No. You know? And uh, I ran into an, the old principal, uh, one of the old principals at Fallbrook High School, and he said, what are you doing? Boy, you look great. And I go... I work out with the, with the geezers, you know, with Mike Bergner. And he goes, the geezers? And I go, and he goes, yeah. He goes, those guys aren't geezers. <laughs> I go, I know. <laughs> it, it's something. You know, so I look forward to coming. And, mm. and it's, you know, I, I, I'm going to be 68 pretty soon. Mm. And I, I can see I'm not going to slow oh down. Yeah, you know? I would say um, when we arranged this and came up, I had a lot of vision of what we might find. Yeah, Coach B, he's great, no question. <laughs> These guys who are older, they're working out there, cool, and Coach B's got this little suburban house and weights in the garage, and I know that gym's epic. Great, we'll make a cool show happen. <clears throat> I think as soon as we got here, we realized, oh, wow, there's something really extraordinary happening. I think we've all grown up around great lifters. We've done okay lifting. I've seen a lot of brutally, brutally strong people train and compete. I'll say, like, I think we we'll all agree, like, to see you guys work out was probably one of the most damn motivating things we've seen in a long time. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just because of the camaraderie mm -hmm. and the belief that we still have stuff that there's all this shit we can't do, and that's obvious, but there's things we can improve upon and work at and improve. And I want to take a moment and say thank you for setting a, a really hell of an example. Mm -hmm. I think if there's anything we can do that's going to be to showcase this vibe and this following spirit and share it with the world and see that just look what you can do when you just keep believing and keep working. Mm -hmm. Whether well, it's your 80s, don't you don't quit and you keep right. grabbing weights and right. it's extraordinary what can happen. So I just take the opportunity to say thank you very much for welcoming us here and allowing us to Well, thank you for us. doing what yeah. you're doing. Well, what you're doing is, is taking the next generation and, and, and like you said, paying it forward so that, you know, we're, we're out of here, we're gone, we're doing it, but you guys are still continuing on. Yeah just like we have, you know, so that's the idea. Okay, here's a question mm -hmm. for all of you. Have you ever been in a situation 
that something you're doing or something you plan, a project or whatever it is, and you've come to a stop, something's not working, and you're stuck. Maybe we've had that yeah. happen a few times. <laughs> <laughs> and you, may, maybe a couple. <laughs> what do you do to get out of that stuck situation? Well, the lesson is, no matter what situation you're in, no matter how tough it gets, think about the worst thing that can happen to you. Mm -hmm. And you'll find virtually 100% of the time, it ain't that bad. Yeah. Right. If it's losing your job, it was meant to be. Right. If it was losing an account, meant to be. You'll overcome it and you'll carry on. So right. the idea is to relax the mind and then go after your resources. Solve the situation and move on. There's always something that's going to come out of it to your benefit if you just pay attention to it. Right. But I have to say, you guys are like bringing me to tears because hearing a group of men that can come together and share their feelings and work out and appreciate what they're doing and get strength from one another and support one another with all the crap they're going through in their lives is huge and the fact that you all bring something to the table that strengthens each other it's huge and I don't go outside a lot and mingle with the geezers I want them to do their own thing but I hear the energy inside of the house and the conversations and it's <laughs> such um, it's like this groundswell of energy coming up and they all help each other out in life whether it's the physical or mental, and that is a gift that you guys give to each other, and um, it really, that's what life's all about, yep. helping each Some other out. Some of the things out. she hears, she will not mention. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, all, it's always from you. It's not from me, it's from you. you. <laughs> yeah, because you don't bring enough toilet paper for the toilet. <laughs> Let's not get pack, into the whole toilet thing. The whole pack is still out underneath the table out there, so, you know, in your face. He's <laughs> Just keep going. I'm leaving. You're doing good. You're doing good. Go on, you're doing good. No, 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 you're doing good. You're doing good. You're doing good. No, he has, I got him. You're in there. Born and raised in Marion, Illinois, Michael Amos Bergner showed athletic prowess from the get-go. Earning 11 varsity letters for sports including football, baseball, basketball and track, he clearly was destined for a life in strength and conditioning. But football was where he excelled, gaining himself a place at the legendary University of Notre Dame, where he majored in economics between 1964 and 1968. It was in these hallowed halls that Mike got a real taste for Olympic weightlifting, joining the 67 Notre Dame weightlifting team who were coached by the infamous Father Bernard Lang. Little did he know, but this would be one of the most defining relationships of Coach Bergner's life. Training daily in Father Lang's gym alongside his friend Fast Eddie, the pair learned to love the iron as much as they loved the man that taught them with it. Lang was an intuitive coach and saw gifts in his athletes that they couldn't yet perceive themselves, informing Mike that he would one day become a great teacher. And so that seed was sown. Flash forward almost 50 years, and Mike now sits at the head of a weightlifting dynasty, with his children Casey, Bo and Sage making names for themselves as world-class weightlifters and internationally recognized coaches. Whether he's training his friends or instructing the big names in the CrossFit world, Mike's genuine love of the sport is tangible, as is the impact that Father Lang had on the man he is today. Marion is uh, due east of Carbondale, Southern Illinois University. Oh, okay. So, and Marion's <laughs> got a great CrossFit box there, too. You know? So I always, when I go back, it's, it's, uh, it's fun because I go there and I teach classes and, uh, yeah. you know, people 
the people there at my CrossFit box, at that CrossFit box, have no clue other than Olympic weightlifting and CrossFit. That's it. They don't know me as the, the football player that, you know, that played uh, football at Notre Dame. They, yeah. they could care less. They All they want to know is how to snatch and clean and jerk better. So, <laughs> What was the view towards strength training when you were coming out of high school, generally? Oh, it, it was non-existent. In fact, you know, I, I think I told the story yesterday, but my dad wouldn't let me lift weights. It yeah. was... <laughs> He was a dairy farmer, basically. He owned a dairy, and, and I had to get up at 4.30 in the morning on holidays and on Christmas and in the uh, summer vacation, and, and we would hook, hook up a team of horses and, <laughs> and fill the, the wagon. It's like one of those little western wagons that, you know, sold the foo-foo juice or whatever to make your ills go away. Well, that's the kind of wagon it was. and we <laughs> Snake oil wagon. Snake oil wagon. <laughs> that's exactly right. So we would, on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, deliver the west side of town. And on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, we'd deliver the east side of town. And uh, I did this when I was real young, you know, to be with him, but also to help him. The coach, you came off uh, your hometown, just work. Just manual labor. Right. I guess first, would you say, would you go back and change that, or was that actually a very good experience, having the base of just hard work before you got to Notre Dame to learn lifts? Well, you know, you get wiser as you get older, you know, and my dad became a very wise man as I got older, you know, up until that time. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can't see that until you get a little older. <laughs> yeah, you can't see that until you get a little bit older. But, you know, the the point, it was, it was a good lesson for him and I because – he he was on to something that, you know, that he didn't know anything about, but he was on that foundational building, you know. I mean, you you build the foundation with, uh, you know, with intensive labor, you know, shoveling horse crap and baling <laughs> hay and, you know, shoveling coal in the coal bin. And, it's also a little humility gets installed in these stages. Yeah, very much so, <laughs> you know. And, uh, you know, you hated it growing up because I wanted to be lifting weights. I you know, I can remember going down to the corner drugstore and getting the Mr. America and reading it from cover to cover and then coming home and sliding it underneath my bed so my dad wouldn't see it, you know. But pull-ups were okay. Push-ups were fine. Yeah. But that lifting of weights and shortening, you know, the curls is what he was talking about. And, uh, yeah, but it formed a philosophy for me because I always believed as I became involved in strength training, I be came to believe that we're going to do body weight exercises before barbell exercises mm -hmm. and we're going to do mobility exercises before we even lift weights so i want you to be mobile you know we want to be flexible and then we want to mm -hmm. do body but you know body weight exercises before barbell exercises and uh it it was it worked out pretty well you know for us and so um that was my upbringing and when i was recruited by notre dame uh, for football mm. as a defensive back, um, I went up there and they had a weight room and it was run by Father Lang. Yeah, so this Mike's gym here is the the cool sign I saw this morning. I didn't quite notice it last time I came by, but welcome to Mike's gym. This legendary place that's sort of pouring over with ethereal strength vibes. This is like a little cathedral sort, but where legends come to be born, where geezers become young, where the spirit of Father Lang lives on forever. I guess I'd, I have to ask you to sort of maybe share the core principles he embedded in this very important age because this, this, these messages are still echoing out. Now this whole population of new athletes is kind of discovering Father Lang in a right. way. You know? Well, Father Lang was truly a man before his time because he was lifting weights and believed in physical culture and strength at a very young age when he was at Notre Dame. He also believed in the water as a means of healing, you know, mm. which is... I mean, this is back in the 20s and 30s, right? I mean, like, and, like ice baths and yes, things like that? Yes, ice baths. And he would regularly go in, I mean, after a hard workout at Notre Dame. And South Bend is not the nicest place in the world in the wintertime. <laughs> <laughs> but there was lakes surrounding Notre Dame. And Father Lang would, as legend has it, would uh, go in and, and uh, chop a hole in a lake. And uh, uh, he would put grease on his body, you know, fat, basically, right? Crisco and grease and whatever. And he would he would dive into the water. Now, we had to preface this disclaimer. No one, please no one try this. <laughs> they're like going to find, they're gonna find your body. Do. They're going to find your body if you're not used to this technique. Yeah, that, well, that's what he would do. And, and you know, he, he taught us that water was the method of healing. It's mm -hmm. interesting, like, a, a lot of people always want to wait on, like, a dozen studies to come out to prove that this thing works, but there's all these things that have been just passed down over the years, and Father Lang probably got well, this from hundreds from, of, like, thousands and thousands of years. Somebody else taught him that, and yeah. it's, it's something that we just all knew, right. but now, like, I, I 
I think that there's this this uh, now that we have the internet and anyone can find inf- any information at all. And if you can't find enough scientific evidence, then it's not something that you're going to do. Right. And so like there's something to be said like hey just listen to your elders. Right. And right. uh and well, they might a- know what they're talking about. <laughs> they may not be able to explain it the way you want to hear right. it, but right. There's probably something there. Well, there's there's no doubt about that because I am a scientific nerd. I have no idea about science, and I don't really care. If I want to know, I'll call Kelly Starrett. Yeah, you know, and Star <laughs> Starrett. You know, we sh- I show his video on this, and and uh, uh, you know we're talking about active shoulders, right? And uh, you know what what is active shoulders? I said, well, this is active shoulders, and. And Kelly will explain it, and I'll just say, show me your armpits. That's all I care about. I don't care about what it does, how it does it. Just show me your armpits. And that's good enough. Right. Because I don't want to get into that minutia. But, you know, that's the way Father Lang was. He was exactly the same way. And he was at one time the fourth strongest man in the world. That's and, incredible. Yeah, I mean, and, mm-hmm. and, and at an older age. I mean, it, it was like he was a man that embodied the spirit of lead by example. You know, and he would... Uh, uh, truly loved the Notre Dame guys you know we were we were his guys and he would open up his weight room at seven o'clock in the morning and guys would start filing in and he'd have workouts for us and and he believed in the Olympic lifts he had a national champion weightlifting team in 1953 wow. because weightlifting back then in the 50s was pretty good you know you had York barbell yeah club was this before or after we could touch our hips yeah yeah oh yeah this was way before and the press is in the total still oh yeah yeah absolutely you, know, you could not touch your hips you had to pull it straight up it became more of an upright row right this is in the 50s but now the s pull came into play when i was at notre dame you know and all of a sudden you know you could take the bar and you could brush your hips you couldn't bang it but you could brush your hips so to speak well you fuss mm-hmm. at the russians or whoever seemed to get away with it in some meets right like, yeah it, well that that's <laughs> it, and it's a matter of interpretation because it became you know you it became one of those things where the press all of a sudden became a olympic press mm-hmm. not a military press where you had to have your feet standing at attention and you had to wait for the clap of the head referee then you could push the bar up you could only lean back one or two degrees and and that was it then it became one of those things where you could clean it and you could rack it and you can get set and then you'd, you'd get set and you'd squeeze the abs together and you'd get down they'd get the clap and then you could drive it up yeah mm-hmm. then it became one of those things you could stand up straight and then you could kind of as long as your knees didn't unlock you could squeeze your abs and squeeze your glutes and drive the weight up and then push yourself back underneath it without bending your knees the reason the press got eliminated, there's two reasons. One, it became too hard to judge because the knees, you know, the Russians, and you know, you take a guy like uh, uh, Alexiev, there became a little bit of bend in the knee, you know, yeah. like a push press. Well, who's going to say anything to, to, the, greatest look in the, world. to the Russian, <laughs> right? So, and then the other thing is, is that I can remember weighing in at competitions at noon and lifting at midnight, Reminds me of some powerlifting meets. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's the real downside of powerlifting, man. Like, if you want to compete, you got to show up at 8 o'clock and you're going home like at midnight. And good luck getting like two or two. Or, like, if you get all three of your deadlifts at the meet, you're some, you either went way too light or you're, you're a freak of nature. Because now you're yawning for breath and how you can get a third deadlift, and I don't know. Yeah. The shorter the better. Well, weightlifting was exactly the same way. I mean, it was we would travel, but that, that was also the fun of the camaraderie of it, you know. I mean, yeah. I mean that old school weightlifting at Notre Dame with my flab buddies. There's there's really no difference between that and the way CrossFit is today. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. I had a note on camaraderie because what you had here with the geezers this morning, what you discovered. I'm assuming maybe for the, one of the first times in Father Lang's gym, the power of and CrossFit's now. There's the workout on the board. Right. And everybody puts a lot of focus on that because this is like our plan. This is very important. This has to go somewhere. We got to believe in that. But, man, I'm telling you, every experience I've had in my lifting career and when I see people, it's like it seems like the magic happens regardless of that. It's like what is happening between people and friends when the barbell is on the ground and how they push each other and the right. mentality that gets set in. Well, camaraderie is everything. And, uh, and you got to understand you got the camaraderie between geezer males, right? <laughs> so my wife comes out. She looks at hears us, listens to us. She shakes her head and goes back in the house. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Because you you guys are mean to each other. I'm saying if I wasn't mean to these guys or they weren't mean back to me, then they would 
probably I probably feel like they don't like me or something's going on because <laughs> that's what men do, right? I mean, men yank each other's chains. That's just the Char- way it is. Charlotte's over there nodding her head. Yeah, yes, you yes, men watches do the this. four of us. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, men will say we each love yanking each- chains. <laughs> 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 We're chain yankers. <laughs> We're chain yankers, exactly. But one of my best friends is Terry, you know, and Terry's the the guy that's over there, and he's the guy that I took to Montana with me and he's a great traveling partner yeah pardon the French but a lot of shit talking between you there's a lot of shit talking (laughs) there's a lot of shit talking by everybody believe me you know they were pretty good with smiles on their faces yeah of course and of course my wife didn't understand that but my wife will then tell a girl oh you look so good you know (laughs) see I mean and not mean it right yeah But they'll tell them something they want to hear, but not mean it. Like, I'm, I'm the dumb man. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Her secret's out. But yeah. we, we will call each other pussies. You are loafing. Get your ass in gear. I'm going to kick your ass. And, and, of course, we don't mean it, but that, that's our way of motivating each other to, yeah. get, to get it going. And it, uh, With those guys, do you, do you coach them, or are you guys just oh, training together for shit, fun? No, I wouldn't coach them you know, if you gave me $100. You know, <laughs> it, no, it, you know, the, the, the beauty of the geezers is that that workout on the board was a, a guide, you know? I mean, okay, I, I can do strict pull-ups, but I, there's a few of us that can, but there's a lot that can't. Um, you know, I can't do push-ups. I can't figure it out. I can do presses, but I can't do push-ups because my shoulders are wrecked, mm. right? So I'll, if I'm going to do push-ups, I'll go over there and do them on a, on the bench and, and do it that way. You find something that works, Mike you do Mike Bergner is scaling a workout. Exactly. <laughs> you heard it here. <laughs> ab- 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 so every one of us scales according to our needs and our desires and what we want to do. Mm-hmm. But did you see anybody loafing, so to speak? You know, I mean, Everybody's huffing and puffing and having a great time. Exactly. Where do you think these mm-hmm. guys would be, Coach, if you guys didn't have have this place to come get together rekindle friendships and have a really strong sort of fellowship thing to carry you into these later years and yeah. how important has it been for these guys to come together like separate what do you have I, mean, I think i think i think it's very important for us to come together because as we get older you know if somebody doesn't make it up here then guess what we're on the line calling them or texting them uh hey you okay dude we got a couple guys that are fighting depression and this gives them a way to get their ass out of bed and come up here. And if they don't come up here, then we are on the line. Have you heard from Terry? No, I haven't. So I'm I'm texting Terry or I'm calling him. Mm-hmm. Hey, sissy boy, what are you? What's up? Why why aren't your ass up here? <laughs> but he knows it's out of love, you know, and he knows that it's it's concern. This is part of the camaraderie. That's the part of it's, it. Is absolutely part of the camaraderie. They refer to you as their lifeline. Uh, yeah. Well, in their mind, you know, it, it's it's like we do things together. We'll go to the movie together, and, you know, we have a mountain over here that we walk and climb. It's called the uh, uh, Mazaret Mountain. And uh, after we hump up that mile and a half freaking hill that's You haven't lost a, any of the geezers up there? Is there a geezer skeleton towards well, the top of this? <laughs> Where the hell's <laughs> Chuck? Perfect. I haven't seen him in two months. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> we left Chuck up on the mountain. <laughs> and then we go out for breakfast and have a good time, you know. Nice. Or like, you know, tomorrow we walk, we'll walk on the beach. There'll only be about three or four of us walking on the beach, and we'll go anywhere from three to six or seven miles, and then we'll come back, and we care about each other. Denny had a bout with cancer. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, if he needed anything, we were always there to, you know, help him out in any way we could. And uh, uh, we just, you know, you look after each other. No, well, the mm-hmm. great way of putting it, we came up this morning. When the, I forget, the, I don't think I caught his name, but he goes, "Did you guys come up here for the bullshit?" <laughs> I looked at him and go, "That's exactly what we came here to get." <laughs> because he, the, the thing was that like, you guys were laughing and talking crap and these stories, but like, uh, you get this stage in life and you realize what is the most precious thing? Yeah. What makes us strong? What keeps us strong? What keeps the echoing of lessons going? What keeps setting this example? It's the camaraderie it's showing up. It's this. This is like the real definition of me. What strength's all about? Yeah, yeah. Is what's well, oozing out of this gym. It, it is that camaraderie in the gym. There's something about lifting iron, and Father Lang instilled that in us. I think I had it in me at a young age because of a stupid magazine or the Charles Atlas, you know, kick sand in the face type of guy. Looking up, you're going to get that you know, that isometric contraction. and uh, But, you know, when I went to Notre Dame and, and Father Lang, 
you know, started our, our, our team, our weightlifting team, it was a group of the flabbers and there's, they were like 15 or 20 of us and we trained together and, and, you know, did shit together. We ate together and, you know, and I was, there were two of us that were football players and, and back then weightlifting was not required. You know, Father Lang's weight room was 1,500 square feet. Mm -hmm. His barbells, the iron plates, there weren't no platforms. There was a wooden platform, but there wasn't rubber. It was a straw mat, you know, that you get your snowshoes rubbed off of. That's where the the plates Uh dropped, you know. And, and, uh, uh, but, you know, for us, that was our, that was our lifeline. So I got a question for you. Earlier, we were looking at the the hooker poster over there of of Ilya uh, setting a world record. Are there any, lifters where you when you're coaching your athletes you you direct them online to watch videos of of some of your favorite lifters like what videos are those who are those people like yeah well who should we who should we go look at if we want to learn like that guy does it perfect watch him yeah well he goes back in time because you know Ilya is my favorite you know he's he's the guy that uh for me is the epitome of what I coach the way I learned and and what I coach so you know I I just tell people a couple things number one um, watch everything. You know, you, you, uh, I have a, a coaching buddy of mine. I won't even mention his name. He and I are really good friends, but he teaches a different style than I teach. Mm-hmm. Um, how many ways are there to skin a cat? You know, there's a thousand ways to skin this cat. Mm-hmm. Well, I want to be able to take an athlete, and if an athlete is good at w- what he does, then that athlete, I'm not going to change that athlete. I'm not, I, I don't want to change him. If he's, if he's not adhering to my style, then I, I don't want to change him because he's having success. Mm-hmm. So it's important for me to look at a thousand different ways to lift weights. Yeah, there's some things that I that I uh, agree with and some things that I don't. But if I have an athlete that uses a catapult method, for an example, and that catapult method, the guy snatching 300 pounds and clean and jerking 400 pounds, I'm not going to screw him up by giving him my method. <laughs> you know, so for me, when I go to my courses, I tell everybody the same thing. I said, look, this is just my way. It's based on Russian, Polish methods. But my advice to you guys is to watch every video that you can watch get out there and just open yourself up to instruction Mm -hmm. you know let me tell you this this is the the fundamentals of teaching are all the same if you put my methods and the catapult method the same off the ground and to that down position we're talking about it's all the same every one of us are the same in those principles now what happens after that is the key Mm -hmm. you know so if i have a guy that is up here and he is doing the catapult method and he's not going to change and he's snatching 300 clean jerking 400 i'm not going to say anything to him about that but i will tell him this you know what that bar's getting away from you man it's swinging out away from you so you better keep it closer that's all i'm going to say i'm not going to say i need vertical hips i'm not going because that's my style Mm -hmm. so to answer your question yeah i'm i'm going to direct them to watch as many videos as they can watch of everybody they can watch Mm -hmm. and then break it down to the basics to the fundamentals and see how this style differs from this style and then just go for do you have any personal favorite videos that someone could go watch on youtube like i know when i was when i was competing weightlifting which i stopped years and years and years ago like i used to watch the old iron mind videos right. back back on vhs like <laughs> yeah. when i was in high school and whatnot yeah. and uh like some of van Ebb's videos or pierce demas or or whoever like I, I would always go back to these same videos right um not even to look at the technique but really to, to see that the speed and the precision and to go whoa that's what i'm supposed to look right. like like, like I, need, I need to move experience. fast like that guy yeah. right. a lot of times with the, with the speed too like my favorite thing to watch is is not when people are hitting record limit weights. It's when they're lifting a weight that I can lift, yeah. and they're making it look silly. <laughs> right, right, right. That was always my favorite right, thing. Right. No, I don't. I don't have any videos of it because I just Google weightlifting and start watching videos. You mm-hmm. know, and it's it's uh, uh, my introduction to weightlifting and the real speed of weightlifting um, was back in the nineties. And here I've been lifting all these years and doing all this stuff. But to really break it down and see how a weightlifter was supposed to move was with a young man that lifted in the 96 Olympics by the name of Tommy Goff. He was a, you know, he was a 90 kilo lifter. Back then they had 10 weight classes and he was a 90 kilo lifter. He was a Marine. He was stationed over here. His dad and I are just old Marine buddies. And, and Tommy 
joined the Marine Corps because of his dad and was stationed over at Camp Pendleton and he trained here. And when I watched him lift for speed, it was like, OMG. <laughs> That's <laughs> what it's like. Oh, I see. I see. Well, and, and, and because, you know, back in the day, you had to be strong. And, you know, if you were gifted for speed, wonderful, that, that was it. But you didn't really understand the transfer of energy from a source mm. to another source, right? You know, so, so, you know, you hear this all the time. How many times have you guys heard... Will I drop under the barbell? Yeah, yeah pretty what, common. Dropping under the barbell is too slow. Mm. And it puts a vision inside your brain housing group that I'm dropping under the barbell. There's so much more to it than dropping under the barbell. Mm. Or, like I said the other day, catching a barbell. Mm -hmm. There's so much more into it. Passive it, language. It's, it's, it's a language that is puts up an image. And an image in your head, and you're going to indoctrinate to that image, Right. But that hook grip video right there of Ilya, it says everything. You can see it, and I can explain it in simple terms so that somebody will go, oh, I get it. Mm -hmm. So that's why you're saying pull yourself down and around the barbell. Mm -hmm. I see why you're saying that now. Yeah. You can't tell somebody without the picture without the video and stopping it and pausing or putting on slow motion, what pulling yourself down and around the barbell means. Because all they're seeing is dropping. Right. Well, dropping is dropping. Mm -hmm. I can put up Miko Tacola, right? I, there's, there's a video for you. Mm -hmm. The guy, he has these epic squat videos where he's just free-falling with like 550 pounds. He's like a 180-pound yeah, guy. Yeah, he's, he's from Finland, and he's a, uh, uh, the guy's a stud. I mean, I, I, I bring that video out and show it at my courses because it, uh, uh, A, shows what speed's supposed to look like. B, it shows how you pull yourself down and around the barbell. And these people are going, and I ask them this at the end of the video. I said, I'm showing you this video for one reason and one reason only. What is it? Speed. That's what they see. They don't see anything else. They see, I will, I will pause and say, is the barbell came close to his body as his shirt rises up? As, as he's pulling himself down and around the barbell, where is that barbell in relationship to his body? Mm -hmm. Oh, my God, coach, is scraping right up his body. So is the bar in the area of the base, which is your feet? Yes. Yeah, so it's in the least line of resistance. Oh, my God. I see what you're talking about. Yeah. So the, the, the analysis of videos to you know and the posters to what your terminology is going to be used is going to get in the the image of what that athlete is is thinking and what that athlete needs to do to become faster mm -hmm. i mean there's only so many people can run a nine one hundred meters right mm -hmm. there's i mean one person maybe right or a nine even i a, came close yeah in college coach yeah, came close. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the beauty of that that that's all genetics right but I can take you and make you faster mm -hmm. without your genetics by teaching you the timing and the pull. Right. Now, we, how do I know that? Because I freaking believe it. And right. you're going to believe it. Like we all, we all start somewhere on the spectrum of, of speed or strength or athleticism, right. but, but everyone can make an improvement from wherever they start. That's it. And That's weightlifting it. is one of the best ways to make that improvement. Right. For me, it's not about, you know, I love to make you an Olympian. But, you know, go back to that racehorse jackass thing, right? I mean, it's, it's you, you have who you have. And so my goal then becomes what? To make you as good as you can become, you yeah. know? And how are we going to determine that? Well, a number's a number. What's your best snatch? 35 pounds. Well, let's get 36. How do you feel when you get 36? I really feel good. Well, then let's go get 37. We don't, I mean, 137 pounds is for you. It's not for you right now. Maybe you'll get there. Maybe you won't. We have to all stand someplace, and we're always competing against ourselves. And when we go to a weightlifting contest, sure, I want to win a medal, but that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is for me to go out and participate and for me to do my best, and hopefully I'll get a one kilo PR. And that's why in this gym, you get one PR, and that's it. You don't go after another one. Why? Because when they're going to leave here, they're going to be happy. I learned a valuable lesson a long time ago. I let a guy go up after he made a PR, I let him go up, and he missed the weight. And what did he do? 
He was like a loser. He was pissed for the rest of the day yeah. because he, he made a PR for God's sake, but he missed another PR, and so he was pissed for the rest of the day. So we just said, forget it. We're going to do one PR, and that's it. Well, what's a PR? That one, guy ruined it for kilo. everybody. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're trying to be too good. Yeah. Exactly. Coach, you were a eight-year-old boy reading Strength Training magazines, and you're 69 now, right? Right. And this morning, still training and pushing it and huffing and puffing. I saw you staring at the clock and say, come on. Mike. Get in your head. Psych yourself up. What, what keeps you training and looking for progress even now? I'm assuming 10 years from now, we'll come back up and see you doing a Tabata around again and, and lifting the bar. Well, I really just want to look good naked. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I got to watch down. That's all that, all that matters. Deep down, that's all. At 69, yeah. you know, you got, I've got a six-pack under all the skin, you know. I mean, it's like, it used to be a six-pack under all the fat, but now i got a six-pack under the skin. I can't identify with this, Because, yeah. I'm, you know, the, the, the geezers can't grow six-packs, I don't think, but it's just in my DNA, you know. It's, it's just who I am. It's in my genetics. And I think... I have my dad to thank for it. Yeah. I really do because he told me I couldn't lift weights. <laughs> that that was it. And it was one of those things where, you know, you're a stubborn ass kid and I'm going to, I'm going to lift weights. He doesn't want me to lift weights. So I'm going to lift weights. And it was like when I got to Notre Dame, I was became so addicted to weightlifting and you know, I, I'm still addicted to it, you know? And it, I just, uh, I have my parents to thank, you know, and I wish I could go back and, thank him today because i was such a dickhead when i was young and uh, oh, i guess you can you can put the yeah. barbell back in iraq and yeah on a early morning here and as you're turning seven you can smile and say dad i guess this shit worked out just fine didn't yeah. It? And yeah maybe you can feel like he's smiling back yeah and i do you yeah. know and i there's not there's not a day goes by that i don't think about them and the and the gifts they gave me you know the gift of hard work and dedication and uh because you don't realize that until that, like I said yesterday, you don't realize that until that Lance Corporal drill instructor slaps you upside the head. Then you mm -hmm. realize yeah. that uh, maybe you ever shut your mouth, you know. You got, <laughs> God gave you two eyes and two ears and one mouth. That means something, you know. So, That's fine. Uh, and well, I'm curious now, just uh, maybe like a final question. What, what would you say to Father Lang now? Thank you. You know, I'd be thank you. Thank you for guiding me. Thank you for being there for us. You know, thank you for listening. You know, and thank you for being a hard ass. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I saw Father Lang take uh, five pound plates and throwing them at all Americans because they didn't get out of the gym when he told them fast enough. <laughs> I mean, that's that was that's old school. You know, it's not today. Yeah. You know, today we don't do stuff like that. But back in the old school, man, I mean, he was a tough hombre and we we just gathered towards him, you know, and and listen to his words of wisdom that he would say and he would get you know he, he had diabetes and he you know he had cancer and he was in pain and you could see it you know and the arthritis in his knuckles and he never ever ever complained and you could just see the sweat coming in and he had kidney stones and you could know that he was getting ready to pass a kidney stone and he never said a word he was one of the toughest no complaints no complaints and he was one of the toughest men that I've ever ever been around and uh you know that leadership that, that guidance that he gave all of us at notre dame the flab people is just uh phenomenal and i've tried to if i could be a a pimple on his behind boy that would be the greatest <laughs> the greatest joy because he 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 truly was my mentor yeah. to quote the Tao Te ching when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And it would definitely seem that Coach B was ready to be completely inspired by the great mentor he was gifted. But it's not enough to be inspired by someone. You have to go full circle and send that energy back out into the world. You have to pick up their torch and carry that light into the lives of those you come in contact with. Coach B is the epitome of that. Whether it's through a quiet Sunday walk on the seafront, supporting his friends and gym buddies, or coaching the steady stream of athletes who turn up to train at his home, the special energy he found with Father Lang lives on in every part of Coach B's life. Father Lang, he talks about so lovingly and the example that he set for Mike is in his heart and in his Everything he does on a daily basis with other people, there's a part of Father Lang in that.
What's clear is that Mike sets the bar in exactly the same way as Father Lang. If you're willing to put everything in, then he'll give you all he has in return. And there are countless lives who Coach B has influenced. Literally thousands of people, ourselves included, who felt the impact of spending time with him. If you're passionate about wanting to be an amazing weightlifter, then come to Mike Bergner and he will do everything he can to help you reach that desire, that goal, that passion. He has no problem giving his time, his energy, his resources to anybody that wants to be the absolute best that they can be and put their heart and soul into it. And that's what he excels at. The core strength of a man is gauged not by his words, but by his every action. It's in how he conducts himself daily, in the quiet moments when no one is watching. You see it in his interactions with others and the light in their eyes when they speak of him. So I even get a little teary eyed. Hold on just a sec. <laughs> I see the impact that um, he has on human beings. There's people that call him his second father, uh, his role model. He gets notes written on napkins from restaurants, <clears throat> sent in the mail, and I'm sitting here with my family and I'm talking about you, and it's, it's touching. Oh my God, I can't believe I'm crying. It is touching and um, I'm proud of him for it. So with such an illustrious career to look back on, the countless accolades and worldwide acclaim, what is important to Coach B? What is his why? The torch he'd like to be carried on through his children and his legacy. For me, I hope that people will perceive me as being very passionate about what I'm doing. And I want them to know that this is my life, this is my blood, this is what I live for, this is what I want to do. And I hope that leadership by example will carry over to them and know then that, man, this guy is crazy. He really loves this stuff and they'll be motivated by that. My gift has been given to me by the ability to teach Olympic style weightlifting as a means to become better at whatever it is that you want to become better at. And I hope that my legacy will be that the people with whom I come in contact will take the information that I give them. And, uh, I hope you enjoyed the show. Head over to Barbell Shrug on iTunes and check out our new exclusive show called Talking Depth, where the crew and I are going to nerd out on this week's episode and keep the conversation going.